give your neighbor a high five and tell him God is going to carry us all the way through the rest of the year. James chapter number one is where our text is coming from today. Obviously, we are uh, continuing to think and reflect about what does it mean to follow the ways of Jesus most faithfully in the times in which we live? What does it mean for us to appreciate that God has a unique call on your life? God has a unique purpose for your life. God has a unique position that no one else can feel unless you are in the right place. And I want you to know, beloved, that there is something unique that God wants you and I to do in this season. And I believe that God is able to sustain and strengthen us to do so. James chapter number one is where we're going to spend our time. This passage of scripture has come up in our lectionary a couple of times over the last few months. Uh, I preached the first half of this sermon, I believe, on the first Sunday of our anniversary celebration in July. Uh, and the title of the sermon was Have We Got Good Religion? And uh, I didn't get a chance to finish that uh, passage of scripture. And so we're going to revisit the passage and also uh, build on that sermon uh, title, uh, Have We Got Good Religion? Part 2. And think a little bit about what does it mean for us to have a faith, a set of practices that are grounded in God's activity among us. Uh, many may be aware that the writer of the book of James is thought to have been uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, and he was one of the earliest uh, disciples, apostles, founders of the early church in the book of Acts. Uh, Peter, James, John, all these folks were kind of hanging out together and they all were continuing to carry out the message that Jesus had given to them. It is worth saying that some of the earliest disciples were a little, what's the word I'm looking for? Legalistic. Everybody know what legalistic means? They had a particular rigidity about their faith. They were not uh, particularly flexible. They had a certain kind of fundamentalism at play. Uh, they were not folks who could extend grace to others. They felt like if it's uh, the letter of the law that is, has been given to us, that we must hold folks very tightly to that legalistic singular interpretation. And while there is something about uh, a certain kind of orthodoxy, a certain kind of right teaching, there is also a danger for many to become uh, overly fundamentalist in your orientation about almost anything. Uh, I do believe that there is an important baseline that God gives us as followers of Jesus to attain and to reach for. But I also believe that there is a spirit or the spirit behind the words. That God is always inviting us into freedom and liberty and not bondage and legalism. For where there is bondage and legalism, there is very small room for grace. And why is grace necessary? Grace is necessary because... None of us are going to get it right all of the time. Do I have a witness in here today? Amen. Even with our best efforts, we are going to fall short. And when we fall short, God's grace, uh, Isaac Newton wrote this hymn called Amazing Grace, is always extended to us. I mean, think about, you know, uh, what your life would be like if God did not extend to us grace. <laughs> I know there's some of us, you know, who feel like, you know, uh, you know, if, 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 if I don't do the right thing, God's going to just strike me down because that's what we've been taught. But, you know, if that was the case, then a lot of us be, you know, we wouldn't make it through the week. <laughs> Maybe we wouldn't make it through the day. Amen. I'm not trying to get in your business, praise God. 
Amen. I know there's few of us, we can go a whole week without sinning, praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. A whole week without making a mistake. A whole week without, you know, acting in error. But uh, I am someone who needs God's grace every day. Not because I'm out here just willy-nilly trying to, like, you know, punch people in the face who get on my nerves on my job or because, you know, I'm trying to cheat on my taxes on purpose or, you know, trying to speak negatively about my neighbor, friend, comrade, partner, homie, uh, rival. It's not like I'm just waking up every day trying to be out of, you know, the will of God. But how many know sometimes there are moments where you can find yourself going awry? And it is in those moments that we need God's grace. And when there is not enough space for grace, you will find a very small space of legalism and rigidity. And so James was one of these who had to struggle with that because he was someone who felt like, you know, we, we must be, we must, we must have a, a, a very strong emphasis on works. But as he became more discipled, I, I would believe, James began to broaden a certain kind of expression that, and we'll read this today, faith without works is dead. So you must have works, but you also must have faith. And in many respects, your faith will inform your works. So as we read this passage, let's jump on in here and let's see what the scriptures uh, offer to us today as we spend some time talking about have you got good religion. James chapter number one, we're going to start at verse number 16. The scripture says this, do not be deceived, my beloved. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the father or the source of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Verse number 18, in fulfillment of God's own purpose, God gave birth to us through the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of God's creation. Some heavy words, heavy thoughts, heavy ideas being expressed here. We'll keep reading, though. Verse number 19, you must understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let everyone, somebody say everyone. Let everyone be slow or quick to listen. Everybody grab your ear real quick. Quick to listen. You see how slow some of you are like, I don't know. I don't believe in that listening thing. But grab your, grab your ear one more time real quick. Be quick to listen. You ought to do that this week when somebody getting on your nerves. I'm trying. Do you hear? Do you understand the words coming out of my mouth. Be quick to listen. Be slow to speak. Put your finger over your mouth like this. And be slow to anger. I just flex your, flex your right hand. Just see if it works. Praise God. Be quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to anger. Listen to this. For human anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. Here we go, verse 22. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers only who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror, for they look at themselves, and when they leave and go away, they immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. All right, we're going to speak again from the topic, have you got good religion? Let's pray. God, bless the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide these words in our hearts so we will not sin against you. 
And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Now, Dolores Williams, she is a very uh, prominent and historical womanist theologian, which just means that she took and takes very seriously uh, the stories of particularly black women who struggled with the faith that uh, had been handed to them, practiced uh, during the earliest years of uh, the uh, African enslavement here in this context and understood that, yes, the, the word of God, the, 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 the good news of Jesus, the, the practice of Christian faith at its best and highest form uh, brings so much liberty and so much freedom. And yet there are those who uh, embrace the practice of Christianity who figure out ways to suck all the freedom and liberty out of this faith. And so as a woman, she was saying, you know, there are other sources, other stories, other testimonies, other practices that black women have been able to uh, 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 catalyze and unlock through the course of this practice of Christian faith. So womanist theologians uh, made distinctive in their own description from feminist theologians want to take seriously that there are ways of being in the world uh, that uh, are unique to black women, unique to those who find themselves suffering from a double, triple, quadruple set of oppressive structures that are worthy to be lifted and animated for the freedom and liberation of everybody. Dr. Dolores Williams, you ought to look, there, look her up. She's a wonderful, wonderful theologian, has informed so much of our work. Uh, she has this quote that I want to continue to ground our preaching in today. Uh, I think they'll put it on the screen. She says it like this, that there can be no holiness, no unity, no Catholicity or universality of the Christian church. Listen to this, until it identifies itself in active opposition to all forms. Somebody say all forms. All forms of violence against humans, female and male. And certainly if she were uh, alive and active today, I'm sure she would include our gender nonconforming and others who may not fit some of these labels. All forms of violence against humans ought to be actively opposed, she would say, against nature, violence against nature, including non-human animals. Mm. All right, that's for all our, our animal lovers up in here. She's talking to you. Against the environment and against the land. That in many respects, there is a declarative admonition, a message from Dr. Dolores Williams to invite you and I to think about what does it mean to claim holiness, to claim right uh, behavior and, 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 and right discipline in the ways of Jesus and still be participating in violence. She would raise to many of us particularly in a time where we're seeing violence uh, unleashed among many in the world, to say that if we cannot posture ourselves against violence, we may not be faithful followers of Jesus. Now, what is so interesting about such a claim is that uh, at face value, very few followers of Jesus would would open up their mouth and say, I am in favor of violence, right? Most people would be like, you know, no, Jesus was a peacemaker. Of course I want peace. But then if you keep talking to folks, they would say, but, <laughs> you know, if, if you do something to me, you know, Jesus will understand, right? If I lay my hands on you, somebody say amen, right? But if, you know, I need, uh, you know, minerals for my iPhone, Jesus understand. Say that. Say that. But if, you know, I don't feel safe, I can wipe out a whole group of people with our own tax dollars. No one says we are affirmatively for violence. Well, not no one. There are some diabolical 
uh, so-called followers of Christianity who would claim that, but most of us would want to identify ourselves with the peaceable kingdom of God. And yet we realize that there is a practice of religion in the world, dare I say Christian religion, that makes us okay with violence, okay with harm, okay with the idea that I can use my strength and my uh, domination to execute what I may think is the right way of being. And I want to suggest to you, beloved, that there's something wrong with religion when it becomes too committed to violence. There's something wrong with our religion when it does not make us uneasy about the harm that is caused. There's something wrong with our faith when we do not see ourselves as natural makers of peace, of harmony, of agents who can resolve conflict without re-inscribing that which created the division and conflict in the first place. I did a funeral yesterday for a 17-year-old young man, hadn't done a funeral for a young man that uh, age in well over five years. It was one of the first times I was in the presence of a room full of teenagers who uh, obviously had just went through one of the worst disruptive social se seasons of our lives with the COVID pandemic, and it was a heart-wrenching space to be in. For I became reminded, as I was almost 15 years ago, uh, when I did a funeral similarly of Larry Spencer, of how besieged our communities are by grief. And how we are a people who have been overwhelmed by grief and not extended much resources for healing. And the grief was so palpable, it f broke me down into tears as I was attempting to finish the eulogy for this young man, and it made me uh, contemplative the whole rest of the day because several things were surfaced for me. Number one, it, it caused me to be very clear that we have failed to be a source of healing for our communities. That we are not able to adequately, certainly as the church, and but more importantly or more significantly as uh, society, as governments, as uh, health departments, as healers and nurturers, young people, young girls, just weeping and wailing. It forced me to contend with the funerals I had done in the past 19 years of my ministry that the only uh, individuals that I could recall weeping and wailing like that were mothers and grandmothers, elders who had lost their children. But these babies were crying. It reminded me of the scripture where Jesus looked at the daughters of Jerusalem and declared that there will be weeping in Jerusalem and there will be no consolation. No one can stop the wailing and the weeping. And it, it just forced me. I was talking with a brother last night around 10 o'clock because another shooting happened on the freeway near my house. And we went outside to try to be present for that and it turned out we think one of the individuals who uh, was in the car was actually at the funeral that we had yesterday. So it was a double kind of whammy for me last night and it just made me, we were talking with the brothers at the, in the neighborhood and at the gas station, you know, and it just, it, just, it just made me ask, where are the healers? Where are the forces of healing? Some of us in this room today may have experienced a certain depth of trauma and we've not yet figured out how to get the necessary healing we need. And so rather than continuing to drill deep into that unaddressed, uninterrogated trauma, we find ways to medicate ourselves through the trauma. 
Sometimes that medication can be with substances. Sometimes that medication could be with uh, coming to church and, and shouting and dancing and rolling on the floor through it. Sometimes that trauma could be uh, through self-harm. Sometimes that trauma could be through shopping. Sometimes that trauma could be through uh, acting out and causing all kinds of harm to others because you're trying to address the trauma within yourselves. And it reminds me that we can have a practice of religion that can cause trauma, but what happens when your religion can't heal trauma? I mean, it's not the best of what God has given us. A balm in Gilead, a source of healing for the soul and the mind and the body and the spirit. I want you to know, beloved, that I do believe that the practice of good religion, and dare I even be more specific, the practice of faithful Christianity, those who want to follow Jesus well, requires us to be committed to healing trauma and not creating more harm. And that all of us are positioned in the world to be a source of healing. Rather than a source of harm. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I can heal some things. I can heal some things. Some of us have to become much more cognizant that God has empowered you and I uh -huh. with gifts. Yeah. Yeah. Gifts that allow us to unlock the divine power of God. Rather than channel the devilish influences of the world. I feel like preaching in here today. Amen. Amen. Some of us need to be mindful that you may not have a degree from UC Berkeley. You may not have a, a, a law degree from, 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 from Haas. Is it Haas? I don't know who it is up there. Amen. Goldman. I don't know. One of these people. You may not have that kind of professional degree, but you do have divine power. You have divine gifts. And one of the great blessings of Pentecostal Christianity, Pentecostal spirituality, is that all of us have access to God's spirit. That is just not the preacher who has access to the Holy Ghost. It is not just the worship leader. It is not just the, the, the minister. All of us, somebody say all of us. All of us have access to the divine power of God. But the question is, with all that power, Will we cause more harm? Or will we be agents of healing? Have you got good religion? To me, it's a question about what will your faith produce in a world besieged by trauma? What will your faith produce? In a neighborhood overflowing with grief, what will your faith produce? In a university climate rife with anti-black racism, what will your faith produce? In a school district that for 30, 40 years has been tracking black children into the underclass. What will your faith produce while you pursue the capitalistic job in the corner office that extracts wealth from the poor? and produces despair and poverty among the needy. Oh yes, beloved, you may not be in charge, but you do have agency. And the agency requires, as a follower of Jesus, to keep asking yourself hard questions. Somebody say hard questions. Now, the first thing that the scripture says to us today is we ought not be deceived. <laughs> How many know there's a lot of deception going on in the world? Oh, uh, there's a lot of self-deception going on in the world. There's a lot of beautiful lies that we love to tell ourselves. Oh, this ain't that bad. Oh, this won't produce that. Oh, this tweak ain't gonna put, make me, you know, more rotundry than I want to be today. Oh, I don't have to, you know, uh, you know, interrogate my puff, puff, passing and my drink, drink, drinking and my snort, snort, snorting because this helps me. But how many know that there's something about deception that does not allow you to outrun the consequences of that which you lied to yourself about? 
Uh, the scripture says, do not be deceived, my beloved. I love the my beloved part of this verse because it does remind you and I that we must be in love with one another. We must be in love with one another. One of the questions I always ask uh, our law enforcement officials, our community leaders, who taught you to fall out of love with your own children? I ask this to our, our, our loved ones when we're worried about crime and violence. Who taught us to fall out of love with our own community members? That Jerome and Pookie and Maria and Jose, they are your sons. They are your daughters. They are your nephews. They are your nieces. Who taught you to fall out of love? Oh, but pastor, they out here causing a lot of mischief and mayhem. Of course they are because they've been rejected from the love. At the funeral yesterday, in tears, I apologized to the mother uh, and the family on behalf of myself, who is a part of the leadership of this region, and on behalf of our churches, who have, for whatever reason, fallen out of love with our children. In the church yesterday, there were only two preachers there. Two preachers, 300 individuals half of them young people most of them said they've been over to over 10 funerals as teenagers and it just made me think where are all the healers what are we doing that we are so out of love and relationship with our families and our communities that when a young man dies none of us are around to be found to provide comfort and cons consolation. What does it mean that we can be so busy in the Bay Area, so full of fear in the Bay Area, so full of anger and frustration in the Bay Area that we don't show up for one another when death visits? Have we become so desensitized? Have we developed such blind spots where we begin to believe that what happens over there does not impact my life in my own home. Some of us have been taught to believe that if it's not my children, then I go to bed thanking God every night. Lord, thank you. Rather than reading and seeing the despair and saying, God, what would you have us to do? Deception will cause you and I to think that in order to achieve peace, we must have violence. We have deception running around in our country today where people are, are literally assigning off on genocide. Political leaders that we like and support, the person I plan to vote for president still has a weak, insufficient voice on how we will stop mass killing around the world. What does it mean that we cannot strengthen our voice and cut through the deception and the lies that make us believe that violence is crucial to securing peace? Now, this is, again, I keep, sorry, I keep going back to this funeral because it's just, it's just in my head and in my spirit. But when you talk to the young men in the neighborhoods and they ask, and I ask them, will you stop engaging in retributive violence? That's like retaliatory. You hit me, I'm gonna hit you hard. You know, the young people's response always points to the United States response around the world. You're asking me to be peaceful in a nation that is extremely violent. And it forces me to reckon with the idea that how can we claim to be a Christian nation? How can we claim to be Christian people? How can we claim to be followers of Jesus and yet be deceived by the pervasiveness and necessity of violence? Oh, somebody say, beware of deception. You and I must ask ourselves what blind spots exist in our life and in our experiences that make us susceptible to deception. How many of you know that we all got blind spots? We all have some spaces and places in our lives that you won't be able to see without some extra support. I don't know if you ever, you know, uh, I remember when I was learning to drive, you know, and, you know, 
you know, growing up in Hearns Point, you know, you know, when you're driving, you know, back then, you know, we used to have our seat all the way back. You know, feet barely can touch the brake. And so you're driving like this with your foot like that. And, 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 and you're driving. You know, that's how we used to drive. I don't drive like that no more. My body don't bend. It's not flexible. Somebody say amen. I remember, you know, I was driving with my father and he, you know, my dad's a muni driver. So, you know, my father's, you know, is a professional driver. You know, he, he, he'd be willing that bus with the, you know, extra parts, you know, doing donuts with the bus. No, I'm just saying he don't do donuts with the bus. But my father would look at how I drove and he said, son, that kind of driving is going to get you and somebody else hurt. I said, what you talking about, dad? I've been driving all these years and I, he said, when you're trying to merge lanes, son, you got to look in your mirror, but you also got to look over your shoulder. Just a quick, why? Because there are things that your mirror will not show you. How many of you know they got some, you got some things in your life without an extra look? Lord, help me to talk to somebody in here today. Without an extra glance, Without an extra second or two of contemplation and reflection, you and I have blind spots that our mirrors will not catch. So you need some extra attention, some extra support. You need to slow your roll before you make some decisions. One of my friends told me that a mentor of hers said, you ought to think twice and act once. I said, Lord, have mercy. Think twice and act once. Why? Because your first thought, it may be a great thought, but sometimes your first thought may not catch your blind spot. Your second thought ought to be that which accounts for the part of your life that you obviously have a blind spot present in. And I want you to know, beloved, that some of us in this season are deceived because we don't take account of our blind spots. And as my father said, you can look in your mirror and still end up in a wreck. Beware of deception. The second thing the scripture says whew, that I think is so important as we talk about Having good religion. Verse number 17 says it like this. Every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the source of lights. In this culture, we've been taught to chase the gifts at all costs. But I believe the scripture is reminding us that we must prioritize the giver. Over the gifts. Somebody say that with me. Prioritize the giver. Over the gifts. Say it again. Prioritize the giver over the gifts. And again, the giver with a big G is referring to the creator, God, Adonai, Yahweh, Jehovah, Jesus. Prioritize the giver, the source of all that is good. Now, this particular line of thinking emerges out of a lot of early platonic and, 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 and other kinds of philosophical thoughts that helped the people to describe what they were meaning when they were describing God. That God in, God, in, in their mindset was the source of all that was good. And goodness emanates from the source. <clears throat> goodness is generated from the source. Goodness reaches into the world from the source. It is not the case that goodness emanates from the receiver of the gift. The readers understood that goodness, gifts, they emanate from the source. And listen to this. One of the earliest theologians uh, taught theologically that the devil, Satan, Beelzebub, Lucifer was the furthest one can be from the source 
and still be in existence. That when you drift away from the source, you become that which is opposite from the source. That generation from God, that emanating from God, emerging from one's proximity to God, gives you and I access to the giver. Why is that important? Because when you and I have access and proximity to the giver, then it guarantees that every good gift that comes into your life, it is coming from the source of all that is good and righteous and just. There are many of us who seek the fruit of the gifts. We think that if I have more money, then I'll be more happy. I'll be more solid. I'll be, if I have more power, I'll, I'll have more security. And I'll, if I have more weapons, then uh, I'll be more respected. Not realizing that the proximity to the source of all that is good is what guarantees us the ability to have access to the gifts. Why is this such an important concept and such an important notion for we who want to have good religion? In this world, we must live counterculturally to the words of, 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 of those who would describe success as having things. Materiality. Dr. King says that the three triplets of evil that must be defeated are racism, militarism, and economic exploitation, uh, materialism, this idea that you and I are judged by how many things we have. My question to some of us today, beloved, do you pursue the giver with the same passion as you pursue the gifts? We can spend hours out of the week trying to check a box at your business, at your employment, on your career to get a certificate, to get some money, to get whatever, but your pursuit of the giver is limited to an hour on Sunday morning. I want you to know that there's something more that God is asking of you and I requiring of you and I, if we're going to have good religion, how can you have a good practice of faith when you're not connected to the source? Every day you wake up, beloved, you ought to take a moment and pause and make a connection with the giver of all your gifts. Every time you find yourself in a situation where you are feeling like you don't have enough, you ought to pause. And make a connection with the giver of all gifts. When you're in the hospital bed, when you're dealing with struggles with your family, when you're going through depression, pause and make a connection with the giver of all gifts because the giver of all gifts never runs out. Can you imagine what it would be like if you really believed that God, me pausing from time to time throughout my day? I love the discipline of our Muslim brothers and sisters and loved ones who at their highest form of discipline, they take time wherever they are throughout the day and they make prayers. They'll pull out a rug or their, their, their sacred uh, 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 practice and, and they'll stop and they'll make a connection because I think they have tapped into this idea that this world is so wicked that I need to pause multiple times a day to make sure I'm connected to the giver of all gifts. I'm not asking you to walk around and just drop on your knees, although you, some of you should. <laughs> Be like, uh, boop, oh God, I just... <laughs> Today is one of them days. But I am asking you to take a 10 minute break from time to time on your job. I am asking you while you are arguing with your children or with your partner, take a 10 minute break. I'm asking you when you're making your money and you know that there's more that God is asking of you. I'm asking you when you're dealing with the worst conditions in your season, take a pause and connect with the giver of all gifts. Because the giver of all gifts, listen to this, always gives you perfect gifts, gifts that are not lacking, gifts that are holistic, gifts that provide you enough to accomplish the task and the, the skill and, and the assignment of your life. Connect with the giver. Make your money, but when you're making your money, connect with the giver. Why? Because when you make your money, the giver is going to ask you, how are you using? 
these resources without connecting to the giver, you will become a taker. Without connecting to the giver, you will become an exploiter. By not connecting to the giver, you will become that which God hates. An oppressor of the widow and the orphan of the needy and of the impoverished. Do you pursue the giver with the same passion as you perceive the gift? How does your life reflect your proximity to the source of lights? I can spend a lot of time on that, but I won't. Why must you see yourself as God's prize? I love the last part of this passage of scripture because it says that we are God's first fruits. What does that mean? You are God's prize. God, when God creates us, he seeds us in the world. He plants you in the world. So wherever you're planted, you can emerge as God's expression of a perfect gift. Some of us are pursuing perfect gifts outside of us when God is saying, you are my perfect gift. You are the one that I put on this block, in this neighborhood, in this business. You are the one that I place. Why? So when you are watered with the word of truth, you can sprout and you can bloom into something that brings glory to God. And what brings glory to God? Defeating injustice. What brings glory to God? Loving your children. What brings glory to God? Uh, consoling those who are who are uh, uh, filled with grief. What brings glory to God? Loving yourself and healing yourself. You can do all of this when you are connected to God and understand that I am God's prize. Not your paycheck. Not your title. Not your position, but you are God's prize. Lord, I don't know if this is resonated with anybody today. But can you imagine if every day you woke up, you said, I'm God's prize. I may flunk this test today, but I'm God's prize. I may lose this job today, but I'm God's prize. Uh, people may walk out and they may betray me, but I am God's prize. I am the greatest expression of God's imagination in the world. And all I need to do is stay close to God. All I need to do is stay close to the source of all that is good and all that is just and all that is righteous. And when I'm close to God, God begins to work on me. And God begins to heal me. And God begins to set things right in my life. God begins to use me as his agent in the world. When I stay close to God, God begins to defeat the demons and the devils that are in my way. When I stay close to God, God begins to give me strength I didn't know I had. When I stay close to God, the devil has to flee. When I stay close to God, demons tremble. When I stay close to God, everything works out for my good. Uh, give your neighbor a high five and tell him, stay close to God. Whatever you do, beloved, stay close to God. Stay in touch with God. Be in proximity to God. Talk to God. Spend time with God. And let God spend time with you. And I believe everything will work out oh, for your good. Stand with me, everybody. We're going to end there. I may have to do a part three next week. Because I still got two more points. But I feel like preaching in here. I need to stay close to the giver of all these gifts. God, draw me close to you. Bring me into your presence. Make me near you, God. I don't want distance between me and God. Whatever it is that is creating distance, God, I need to I need to put that aside. I don't need to have distance between the giver. I don't need to allow distance to create deception, self-delusion. God, I want to stay close to you. Whew, grab the hand of someone next to you. Oh, Jesus, oh, God.
God, you are the strength. The strength like no other. And it reaches to us. You are my strength. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. And it reaches to me. Come on, if you know that, just say that one more time. You are my strength. Strength I'm touching today. Give them your strength. Give them your power. Give them your anointing. God, they are in a moment and in a season where they must be clear about what it means to have faithful faith. Faith that resembles the faith that has been handed to us. Faith that resembles the peace and the power that has been delivered to us. Bless my beloved neighbor, my friend, my comrade my sister my brother my loved one bless them right now in the name of Jesus God if there's deception at work in their life I pray that your spirit will cut through the deception God if there's a commitment to violence and harm I pray today that your truth will cut through my father it is not my sister it is not my brother but it's me oh lord and i need you somebody say i need you lord come on say it again i need you lord say it again i need you lord i need you to heal me i need you to forgive me i need you to save me god i need you to hold me and my family together i need you to hold our community together i need you to hold our 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 schools together bless our teachers Bless our professors. Bless, God, those who hold our children in the palm of their hands, their minds. God, may their hearts and their minds remain on fire for learning. May our families remain in love with one another. Through the transitions that come up, Lord, may our bodies withstand this COVID-19 pandemic that continues to ravage us. God, I pray for the healing of our people. I pray, God, for the Huff family and for the Terry family. For all those, God, who still mourn the loss of their loved ones. I pray for all of us in here, God, with our hands lifted that have grief that has yet to be attended to. I pray, God, for the grief of Palestine. I pray for the grief of Haiti. I pray for the grief of Ukraine and the grief of Oh God, of all the peoples of the world experiencing mass murder and killing in the name of peace. Use us as instruments of your peace, oh God. Not as instruments of war, but instruments of peace. 
and we'll say thank you God we'll say thank you God we'll say thank you God draw us nearer to you in Jesus name we pray hug two or three people and tell them I got good religion today tell them that I got good religion I got good